So Jonathan gave me the possibility to introduce this webinar. It is an honor for me. It is a pleasure to be with all of you this night, as always. This should be the 27 or 28th webinar we are doing for Ukrainian population, always thinking to you. And uh, it's a pleasure to present this night uh, a, a webinar on phalangeal fractures. And uh, we have uh, two important speakers. One is David Schuring, that is consultant and uh, um, in, in Cardiff are many, many years. And he uh, had many, many roles in the BSSH and he cured a lot of fractures of the fingers on the phalanx. And the other one is Jonathan Hobby talking about uh, the same subject, but more for internal fixation. So David, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Pierluigi. Um... Andre, do you want to... Andrew, do you... Do, you want, do you want to translate a little bit what we are talking about? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry, David. While David uh, start his uh, presentation, uh, отже, доброго вечора, шановні колеги. Раді вас вітати на нашому вже 27 чи 28-му вебінарі, що ми проводимо сумісно з, з Європейською федерацією Асоціації хірургів кісті ФЕШ та британською ким товариством хірургії кісті BCSH. Сьогоднішня наша зустріч присвячена пер... лікуванню переломів фаланг пальців. Наш розклад буде складатися з початку з лекції Девіда Шивінга, який є відомим кістьовим хірургом Британії. Він займав доволі багато різноманітних посад в британській товаристві хірургії кісті і є відомим спеціалістом з лікування переломів фаланг пальців. Він прочитає нам загальні принципи лікування. В подальшому Джонатан Хобі, наш з вами великий друг, прочитає лекцію по хірургічному лікуванню проводні фаланг пальців. Після цього у нас будуть питання, відповіді, обговорення, і в подальшому Девід представить декілька своїх клінічних випадків. Тож, будь ласка, якщо у вас виникають якісь запитання, пишіть їх в чат або в, через функцію Q&A. Будьте активними, можете писати їх українською мовою, і ми їх перекладемо. So, thank you very much, David, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. Tonight, I'm going to be focusing on the proximal phalanx. I have done a lot of work on intraarticular fractures of the middle phalangeal base, but that will be presented by my colleague, Ryan Trickett, at a future date. Fractures of the proximal phalanx are unforgiving. Although the majority of these should be treated non-operatively, if they are treated poorly, with a lack of respect, and if the wrong tools are used in the wrong way and in the wrong hands, then the result will be catastrophic and irretrievable. Here you can see a large dorsal plate has been applied. There is a non-union which probably reflects poor soft tissue handling, and so the plate has failed. And here you can see this snapped off drill bit, which really should not happen. And this applies whichever fixation method is used. Generally speaking, with these fractures, you get one chance of getting a good result. And if that chance is missed, it tends to be a downward spiral. Good results can be obtained, but this entails careful planning and consideration of all the various methods in your armamentarium. The cornerstone of treatment of any of these fractures are the services of skilled hand therapists there should be immediate access to these, and so ideally they should be with you in the clinic. The mechanism of the injury will have a bearing on the treatment plan. This is a fracture resulting from a crush. The fracture is comminuted, but undisplaced. And so the periosteum is likely to be intact, and so the fracture may be relatively stable. In contrast, 
a spinal fracture. The trauma will have been indirect and the shape of the fracture echoes the rotational nat nature of the force involved. Although the fracture could be said to be undisplaced, this is relative as the very fact that the fracture is visible will indicate that there is some displacement. The finger will need to be inspected carefully for signs of malrotation. All taping must be removed prior to examination. Either the finger is gently flexed to make any malrotation more obvious, or the relative orientation of the fingernails can be inspected. Many of these patients will have a tendency towards irresponsibility and to avoid patients appearing the following week with the fracture looking like this, I tend to protect them with a splint for the first week or two. They can take the splint off to mobilize in a safe environment, buddy tape at night, and then mobilize more fully after a couple of weeks with taping. Care has to be taken not to over splint as stiffness will readily ensue and you have to be careful as the therapist can be a little over enthusiastic from time to time. You may have to specifically indicate to them, do not splint at night. However, when faced with a phalangeal fracture that is displaced, unstable or comminuted, then one needs to consider everything that one has at one's disposal to deal with it. The method chosen will be informed by the configuration of the fracture and the skill and experience of the surgeon in each of the techniques available, and perhaps most importantly, the nature of the patient. The priorities, occupation and compliance of the patient must be established. For example, this fellow is going to have different priorities and expectations to this lady. One could say beauty and the beast. If fixation is indicated, then there is a spectrum of techniques. At one extreme would be a strong, robust fixation, such as this plate. At the other end of the spectrum, a minimal fixation, such as a single wire inserted closed. This has the significant advantage of the soft tissue envelope remaining undisturbed. K wires are inexpensive and can be inserted quickly. Where there is associated severe soft tissue injury, they are invaluable in avoiding further soft tissue damage. Insertion of the wires through the distal end of the proximal phalanx should be avoided. The proximal interphalangeal joint is particularly intolerant of any form of insult and is usually the main source of trouble after these fractures, however they are treated. There is rarely any need to insert the wires here. I find it preferable and easier to insert the wires from the base of the phalanx and up into the intermedullary canal. This provides a minimal fixation with the least possible disruption to the soft tissue envelope, which then remains largely undisturbed. If the fracture can be reduced closed and if operative intervention is indicated, this would be my treatment of choice. So here is an example. We have a shaft fracture, which is malrotated, comminuted and unstable. It is only a few days old and so reduces nicely with some traction. And so the first decision, which side of the phalangeal base should we choose to insert the wire? Due to its configuration, the fracture wants to migrate this way, as you can see. And so we want the tip of the wire to create a buttress in order to create maximum stability. And so ideally the wire should be inserted here. The wire is inserted percutaneously and then advanced between the metacarpal heads to the rim of the base of the proximal phalanx. This bony rim can be felt with the tip of the wire and then engaged. A lot of this is done by, by feel. It is a good idea to get the entry point slightly medial as here. Otherwise the shoulder of the diaphyseal cortex, which may be thick in younger patients, will push the wire over and it may become difficult to get the tip past the fracture site. And so the wire is advanced up to the fracture site and then checked on the lateral to ensure that it's actually in the medullary canal. At this point, you should advance the wire slowly so that it does not engage the cortex 
and actually skives off the cortex. And you can see that the wire is doing this and is bending very slightly. You then reduce the fracture so that it is as close to an anatomical position as possible, as you have to negotiate the tip of the wire into the medullary canal of the distal fragment. As the wire passes across the fracture site, you can see that it will push the fracture into reduction. Ideally, you want to get a distal cortical engagement or get it up into the condyle because that makes it rotationally stable. And so you may have to withdraw the wire slightly, put it on high speed and then reinsert it. And if you get that engagement as here, there is no need for a second wire. Afterwards, the metacarpal phalangeal joint is splinted in flexion to prevent irritation of the skin by the protruding wire. As you can imagine, if the MCP joint is allowed to mobilize, that wire will wiggle about in the skin, you will probably get a, a pin site infection. But the interphalangeal joints are allowed to mobilize. The pin site is cleaned regularly in a nurse-led clinic, and then the wire is removed in the clinic at around three and a half weeks. Here we can see another case with a rather comminuted fracture of the shaft and base. You can see that it is quite angulated at the base and we'll explore that idea later. It reduces nicely with traction. And here we have a cortical engagement at the base. The wire is advanced past the fracture site more easily in this case. And then we have a good cortical engagement distal to the fracture. And this is actually very stable and there is no need for a second wire. Fractures at the base of the phalanx through the metaphyseal bone have specific problems. Due to the pull of the intrinsic muscles, these fractures tend to angulate with the distal segment pulled dorsally, as you can see here. Normally, the pull of the intrinsics passes palmar to the axis of rotation of the metacarpophalangeal joint, and they therefore usually have a flexor influence on that joint. If the fracture is allowed to heal in dorsal angulation, then the line of pull of the intrinsic muscles becomes more dorsal to the axis of rotation of the metacarpophalangeal joint, so that then they have more of an extensor influence on the metacarpophalangeal joint. And this results in loss of flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint, which no therapy can overcome. I therefore treat these fractures operatively with a K-wire driven up from the base as discussed earlier. It is not necessary to cross the joint itself, as has been recommended by several earlier authors. I've been doing this technique for many years, and we published the results of a series of these in the Journal of Hand Surgery a few years ago. Alternatively, the wire can be inserted into the distal end of the phalanx and then exit the shaft of the, of the cortex. The wire is withdrawn with the trailing end left in the subchondral bone, and this avoids interference with the collateral ligament. A single-ended wire is best for this, and this is a particularly useful technique when the physis is open. I rarely use a wire bigger than 1.2 millimeters for a phalangeal fracture, occasionally a 1.4. The wires usually remain in place for three and a half weeks, a bit longer if it's a transverse mid-shaft fracture, and then are removed in the clinic. There are certain situations when use of KYs is not possible or not advisable. This fracture, for example, which is over three weeks old and will not reduce closed, probably due to a combination of fibrinous material in the fracture site, as well as soft tissue interposition at the insertion of the collateral ligament. And so you should be prepared to open these if necessary. And when you do, this will determine the approach which in this case should probably be from this side, the site of the likely block to reduction. As shown here, I use a lateral approach as you get less stiffness because you avoid uh, violating that plane between the periosteum and the extensor mechanism, which otherwise will stick down. The periosteum is incised and then elevated with a sharp elevator. This is a, called a Mitchell's trimmer and I, I think it's the most useful tool on my tray. You can clean out the fibrinous material, which prevents reduction. And this is important. The reduction has to be absolutely as perfect as possible. In these cases, that phrase, 
the enemy of good is, is perfect does not apply. It must be perfect. This fracture was several weeks old, which is why it was opened. And there were some flakes of comminution here. Two screws were used for this one, two lag screws. And you can then smear the drill reamings into the fracture. And this is particularly useful if there has been some slight comminution. The drill bit is a good source of these reamings. The finger can be mobilized early. I tend to just bandage it to the other finger, to the adjacent finger, no plaster, and then a referral to the therapist a few days later. And so these are the advantages that a secure fixation would have over k -wires. You can see that the reduction is perfect and the fracture now cannot be seen. This is essential so that the interdigitations of the fracture give extra stability to facilitate vigorous mobilization. However, there is a big caveat for using screws. This is a legal case which came my way. As you can see, an attempt has been made to fix it with two lag screws, but the fracture has not been reduced. And so a secure fixation has not been achieved, despite what was claimed in the operation sheet. And on the lateral view, this is even more obvious. And so with this, we have all the disadvantages of surgical intervention with an added surgical insult to an already compromised digit and none of the advantages. Not only that, but the finger is in malrotation, the worst of all worlds, and nothing but harm has been done to this patient. And that is unforgivable. I would not use k wires to fix condylar fractures. This is a case inherited from a well-known center in a different part of the UK. These fractures require accurate reduction of the joint surface and a stable fixation to enable mobilization. And a single lag screw is best for this. So what are the advantages of, of K-wires, particularly over, for example, an intramedullary screw, which I think Jonathan Hobby is going to mention in the next talk. K-wires are simple and so often simple works best. There is just less to go, less to go wrong. KYs are widely available and easily accessible all over the world, and there is no need to rely on any support from industry representatives. They are cheap. A typical cannulated screw costs 320 times more than a KY. The procedure is technically easy. I can teach a competent trainee to do this KY technique in one case. Virtually all fracture configurations are suitable for this technique. The soft tissue envelope around the fracture is preserved, and there is very little disruption to the intramedullary blood supply of the bone itself, which must be better for healing. There is no violation of the articular surface of the base of the phalanx, unlike the intramedullary screw technique. If managed properly, complications are uncommon. I have heard claims that there are adverse effects from transfiction of the sagittal bands next to the, of the extensor mechanism, and I have never seen a problem from this. The disruption to the patient is minimal and extends to merely a few weeks after surgery whilst the wire is in place. It is very easy to remove these wires and it can be done by a nurse in the clinic. This is in contrast to a double-headed screw such as the CCS screw. Once the fracture has healed, removal of such a screw is virtually impossible as to do so relies on distraction of the two engaged ends of the screw, which is then not possible because the fracture has healed. This is obviously a significant potential problem, and I've heard of the screwdriver snapping when this is attempted. There are, of course, some relative disadvantages to K-wires. They protrude, which is a nuisance, but only for a few weeks. They do re require removal, although this can be done by a nurse and clinic. K-wires do not make much profit for the, for the equipment companies. And a K-wire is not as glamorous as a lovely shiny screw, which often come in tempting colors specifically design, designed to seduce particularly male surgeons. Unlike the humble Kirchner wire, which is safer, cheaper, easier, more versatile, and more biology friendly. Before we finish, rotational malrotation is worth a mention. This patient was hit with a machete outside a drugs den in Paris masquerading as a kebab shot, kebab shop, prior to which a gun was brandished. His wedding ring probably saved his hand. There was a comminuted fracture, which was stabilized with a multitude of 
wires rather like a porcupine. However, it was fixed in malrotation. The approach here was to obtain union, get rid of the metalwork, and then get a as full a range of movement as possible before addressing the malrotation. Metacarpal osteotomy has been advocated as it is thought to be less hazardous, but it makes sense to perform a correction as close to the site of the deformity as possible. If the osteotomy is performed through cancellous bone at the base of the phalanx as here, then bony healing should not be a problem. The surgery is well away from the proximal phalangeal joint and in particular from the central slip and collateral ligaments. A good correction can be achieved. And so the challenges of the proximal phalangeal fracture are many. The problems are all too common, but if they are given due respect and treatment is carefully planned, then good, re good results can be obtained. If operative intervention is indicated, you really only get one shot at these, and they are not for the occasional or for the unsupervised inexperienced surgeon. And above all, don't make the patient worse. Thank you. Thanks, David, for the great presentation. David. Yes. Jonathan. Hello, hello. Uh, I have uh, to say that. Okay. After. Can you hear me? Jonathan Hobby. Yeah. You can hear me. I'm not muted. Please, Perfect. Jonathan. Thank so uh, there will be a little overlap between David's talk and my own, but I think that's uh, no bad thing. So I have no financial disclosures, uh, although uh, Ryan Trickett has helped me with uh, some of the, the slides in this presentation. Palangeal fractures are actually quite common. Uh, if you look at the incidence of uh, of fractures, they're much more common in young men, <coughs> and uh, we all know that fifth metacarpal uh, neck fractures are common. But actually, proximal phalangeal fractures in the little finger are also very common injuries. Uh, there are a variety of fracture configurations, and one of the difficulties when talking about proximal phalangeal fractures is they're not all the same. Uh, we often talk about uh, apples and pears or apples and oranges, but not all fractures are, are the same, not all patients are the same. So actually, when you're looking at proximal phalangeal fractures, there are a number of things to be taken into consideration when planning the treatment. And uh, in the words of uh, Professor Swanson, uh, hand fractures can be complicated by deformity from no treatment, stiffness from over-treatment, and both stiffness and deformity from poor treatment. To fix or not to fix, uh, that's the question. The indications for intervention are malrotation, angulation, fractures that cannot be held reduced by closed means, open fractures, or where there is uh, segmental bone loss and composite loss with loss of soft tissue. And also, if patients have multiple fractures in the hand, that is a relative indication for intervention. This is uh, an example uh, of a fracture which uh, a healed fracture so in extension it doesn't look too bad but when the patient makes a fist you get scissoring of the digits this is very, rotational deformity is very poorly tolerated and will not remodel also you may get angulation and this is a particular problem in, in the little finger and untreated angulation can lead to a batonic type deformity with stiffness of the pip joint which is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to correct once uh, the fracture is healed and the extensor is scarred. So what can we do? Well, close reduction and splinting, 
clothes reduction and percutaneous fixation, uh, usually with a wire, or open reduction and fixation. Splinting may be as simple uh, as buddy taping, and this works particularly well for the border digits, uh, in that the intact finger uh, acts to help to correct the rotation of the injured finger in flexion. I don't particularly like aluminum splints, but in some situations they can be helpful. There are a variety of more complex splinting arrangements that can be used with dynamic traction. And recently, there's increasing interest in the use of yoke splints, and these can be particularly helpful uh, for extension deformity uh, in the, the central digits by uh, forcing the uh, phalanx into flexion. Also, in some uh, rare cases, an external fixator may be helpful, particularly in the border digits. <laughs> David uh, has huge experience of K-wiring and has presented a beautiful exposition of the role of K-wires and the technique. And for many injuries, uh, this is appropriate. Uh, uh, and particularly uh, if you have a huge burden uh, of injuries, this is quick and safe and very effective. Uh, K wires can be also used uh, transversely, although in this uh, particular instance, the reduction is less than perfect. Uh, the, the, the absolute key uh, is that there is no malrotation. Uh, screw fixation uh, uh, is also uh, helpful for the spiral fractures. Uh, and in some instances, uh, plate fixation may be appropriate. The overriding problem uh, with these fractures is the extensor apparatus. It's often injured as part of the uh, fracture, and there is a very real risk of stiffness uh, uh, if uh, movement is not possible. Uh, and the risk of stiffness is uh, substantially increased by surgical intervention. So I would argue if you're going to fix a fracture, you have to fix it in a way that you can mobilize the fracture immediately. If you don't achieve a good enough, stable enough reduction to allow immediate mobilization, there is a very real risk of stiffness uh, and that you will make the patient worse by your intervention. So here's a spiral uh, fracture of the ring finger, perfectly reduced by buddy taping uh, and no further intervention is required. Another fracture which presented to my clinic uh, after a couple of weeks. Uh, when I examined the patient, he had quite a good range of movement. So we, we decided to uh, persevere with conservative management. And actually, in spite of the uh, shortening on the x-ray, there's no rotational deformity. And he had a very good result. This, as David said, is the worst of all possible worlds. There's been... The surgical intervention, the fracture hasn't been reduced. Uh, it's been fixed in malrotation. Uh, this must be avoided. For the uh, extension type fracture, uh, you may find that splinting uh, will satisfactorily reduce the fracture, uh, in which case it is preferable to surgical intervention. Uh, Close reduction K wiring is, as David said, uh, a very good option. It's not without complications. And uh, there is a, a skill uh, to K wiring um, uh, that is important uh, that it's performed competently. What about uh, close redu uh, reduction and screw fixation? Uh, this can be uh, performed using cannulated screws, which have the advantage you can place some uh, place wires and uh, pass a screw along the wire. I would caution that the cortical bone is often quite hard, 
Uh, so I would advise you put two wires in, over drill the wire and insert the screw um, in that if you don't do that, there is a, a, a risk that the screw may get stuck or break. Uh, and the other thing you need to be aware of is on occasion, a simple looking fracture will have undisplaced fracture lines uh, and the situation can rapidly become much more complex than you would envisage at first. So have a plan B uh, if the fracture turns out to be more complex uh, th than you had initially suspected. Um, plate fixation, uh, in the right uh, situation, uh, can be helpful, but you must perform immediate mobilization. And for the majority of these fractures, I would now use uh, an intramedullary uh, cannulated screw. The risks of internal fixation are infection, stiffness, loss of fixation, malrotation, and in some instances, uh, you can injure the flexor or extensor tendons. This paper uh, shows really quite a high rate of stiffness uh, following uh, inter rigid internal fixation. Uh, and uh, is a, a cautionary tale, really. And obviously, uh, if you perform internal fixation and don't get an adequate reduction, uh, you can have the problems of uh, uh, deform rotational deformity uh, or uh, extension deformity. As David said, with these fractures, you get one chance. And internal fixation is definitely uh, something that you either love or hate. This is a randomized controlled trial uh, in which a small trial in which they found better results uh, with uh, plate fixation than K wire fixation, although this really does go against most of the published literature. So Close reduction may be difficult if treatment is delayed, and indeed, open reduction uh, may prove uh, to be challenging if there's callus in the fracture site. You can use a dorsal or lateral approach. Uh, I tend to prefer a dorsal approach, um, but for a fresh fracture where you can achieve a good close reduction, uh, a lateral approach uh, is less invasive. Beware of comminution, as I've already said. If you're going to intervene, you must achieve stable fixation, which allows immediate mobilization. Cannulated screws are an option for lag fixation, and you may want to consider unicortical screws if plating to avoid the risk of perforating the far cortex and interfering with the flexor tendons. And you need to se select the patients carefully in that if you're going to perform internal fixation, you need to be confident that the patient will cooperate with rehabilitation. So one or two examples. Uh, this is uh, an old example uh, of a patient uh, from over 10 years ago who's a professional uh, ice hockey player. Uh, he came uh, with a, a uh, rotated uh, proximal phalangeal fracture in his left index finger uh, sustained in a fracas. Uh, I discussed the options with him. He was very keen to be able to get back to early playing and training. And I was confident uh, that he would be diligent with his rehab. Uh, so I performed a plate fixation supplemented by a lag screw to ensure that there was maximal stability. And he was back training within a couple of weeks and playing within a month uh, and got a very good result. Uh, but he was an unusual patient and he had good bone stock uh, and was very uh, diligent in his rehab. Uh, cannulated screw fixation, uh, described initially by uh, uh, Paco Pinal, is something uh, that I am using more and more frequently. Uh, it does entail uh, splitting the uh, extensor mechanism. Uh, and there is some damage to the articular surface. Uh, but there's 
uh, you, it allowed a, uh, immediate mobilization. And the results uh, in, in my hands uh, have been very satisfactory. Sorry, even to some more comminuted fractures. They can be uh, inserted retrograde or antegrade uh, and are a very useful tool. Uh, the published results are pretty good. Ryan Trickett performed a, a systematic review of phalangeal fractures, incorporating a number of studies with a huge range of techniques, uh, and basically found that the evidence base was not sufficiently strong to allow any firm uh, conclusions to be drawn. Uh, another more recent uh, study uh, looking at a large number of uh, studies with different techniques and their recommendations were that really non-operative treatment was preferable uh, where possible. They were unable to draw any firm conclusions uh, on whether uh, K wire pinning or transocular pinning was superior. Although I think I would uh, avoid transarticular pinning where possible. And the result, there was no uh, uh, no difference really between K wires and lag screw fixation. Uh, they also felt that lag screw fixation was preferable to plate and screw fixation, uh, predominantly due to the reduced uh, amount of metalwork required. This is a, a recent example uh, of mine, uh, a man who presented with a hyperextension injury with a nasty complex fracture uh, with a large open wound. I attempted plate fixation, but was unable to achieve uh, a satisfactory reduction. So I ended up uh, using a number uh, of uh, lag screws and position screws. The fracture healed uh, with uh, an extension deformity close to the joint. Uh, but he's been diligent with his therapy and has a very satisfactory uh, functional result. So in conclusion, the evidence for internal fixation is poor. Most fractures can be treated conservatively. There is a risk of stiffness and it's technically challenging. If you're going to a, a, a perform internal fixation, uh, you must get uh, as near as possible to a perfect reduction with stable fixation to allow immediate mobilization. Thank you, we'll take some questions. Just remember that function is more important than form. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, I have to say that I know Jonathan and David from the Fesh Academy, and I learned a lot from them in this kind of fracture treatment. Really, I, I apply the rules they are talking about and uh, when is possible, don't use plates. And this is the key point. The other key point is timing. Because if you have a fresh fracture, you can do what you want. But the if the fracture is after 12 to 20 days, you are in trouble. And many times this happens in Italy, <laughs> in Italy. So too much time to arrive to the surgery. So thank you very much, David and Jonathan, for these outstanding uh, lectures. Andrew, do you, do you want to say some comments? Then we, we start with uh, question and answer. Yeah, I want to say that uh, in the last uh, year and a half, I've have become a huge fan of key wires uh, because <laughs> because uh, most of these 
uh, gunshot injuries and uh, so on, and fractures of the phalanges and metacarpals. Uh, they are with some defects of soft tissues, and also they are mostly uh, infected. So it is much more easier to put some key wires. And if something goes wrong, you always can take off key wires just uh, in a clinic. You don't need to uh, go to ORs to take out this uh, plates and other stuff. So uh, key wires are really, really good and I use them a lot. <laughs> as I say. And for the phalanges, it's, yeah, it, it works really well. So uh, thank you and thanks for these many tips and tricks of uh, how to deal with such kind of fractures with, uh, that we ha can help. So Jonathan, may I ask you to close the, the presentation? Thank you. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> so we only have two questions, uh, one in Ukrainian and one in English. So I will translate the Ukrainian one. And yeah. Then <laughs> you and I translate in Italian the English. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> so uh, the first question is, uh, what uh, your preferred uh, management of uh, intraarticular fracture of the uh, distal uh, met metaphysis of the phalanx, distal metaphysis of the phalanx, so. the proximal and the middle phalanx. So, sorry, Andre, the the, the, pro the the distal end of the distal so end, a, the, a, cond uh, a, a condylar fracture. Yes. So I think, it, uh, as David pointed out, um, if it's a unicondylar fracture, they have a high tendency to displace. Uh, and you can normally manage them very satisfactorily uh, with a, a single uh, screw. I think David has a lovely uh, slide sequence uh, of such a case. Thank um, you. If it, if it's a bicondylar fracture, that's a little more difficult, um, and uh, you may uh, need to consider uh, plate fixation. Uh, a locking plate can be quite helpful. David. Yeah, <clears throat> I again I I don't like those locking plates. They're very bulky and they tend to transfix the cartilage ligament. So I've never ever put one of those. On, I think they're the work of Satan. Uh, and all you need for a condylar fracture is a single lag screw that can be quite easily placed by just slightly elevating the uh, collateral ligaments. And as long as you uh, reduce the condyle accurately so you get a nice interference fit with the interdigitations of the fracture, then a single lag screw is all that you need. And that's enough to mobilize the fracture immediately. And I can get you at that sequence of. Um, uh, of condylar fracture, fracture fixation, if you want. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. What about a bicondylar fracture? Um, they are much more difficult. I mean, if um, <clears throat> if one of the condyles is longer, you can fix that to the shafts, and it, it might need a bilateral approach. Uh, but um, they may be better if, if they're undisplaced. They're better managed non-operatively and just very very carefully um, without mobilising them too early. Uh, and uh, if they um, if they do need some sort of surgical intervention and uh, the condyles are about the same size, it may be better just to use a couple of K-wires drilled in from distally and leaving the trailing ends in the in the condyles themselves. But they are a much um, you know they're a, a much bigger challenge. I'm just looking for well, 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 while you're looking for the. Um... The your nice slide sequence. Uh, I see there's a question in in terms of uh, choice of uh, anesthesia, and I, th I think for anesthesia, really, you can do pretty much whatever you're comfortable with: general anesthetic, brachial plexus block, uh, local anesthetic, 
uh, with or without a tourniquet. Um, uh, for um, for many procedures in the finger, you can use a digital tourniquet, which gets over the problems with uh, tourniquet pain uh, from a forearm uh, tourniquet. The, the only thing I would say is if you're going to do it under local anesthesia with the patient awake, you need to be really reasonably confident uh, in your technique uh, in that if you, you you can't swear or throw things, uh, if you have difficulties, the patient uh, will be uh, aware. So uh, it puts a little bit more pressure on you to do it under a, uh, a local anaesthetic. The, the area where local anaesthetic is really helpful is where you're worried about the tendon balance. So something like a, an extensor tenolysis, uh, uh, I would now uh, always do under local anaesthetic uh, in that it actually allows you to judge whether you've performed an adequate tenolysis or not, and the patient can see what you've achieved. So I've got it here if you want me to put it up. Yeah, what what about anesthesia before you do that? I tend to use general anesthetic. Most of these patients are going fit. And um, it's often on a really busy trauma list. And if I've only got one anesthetist that I have really not got time for them to be messing about doing blocks in between cases. And so they're young and fit, they just have a general anaesthetic. It takes about 40 minutes to do the operation and I don't think that's a problem. Um, right, yeah, Regine? Let me just share. Yeah, go on then. So there is another question about the rehabilitation protocol. Uh, how long is the therapy? All patients are going to the therapy, and when you leave completely free, the patient to do everything. Obviously, depend from the fractures and 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 the stability of the fixation. Well, I get the therapists to see these patients within a couple of days, and then they just mobilize them immediately. So. Um, so con condylar fractures are common and they usually occur as a result of an axial load on the digit resulting in a sort of tilting of the joint and a sort of shearing stress. They're unstable and you can see they've got an oblique fracture pattern and malunion you'll get deformity and incongruity of the articular surface. They're difficult to treat non-operatively although it's easier in children if they're undisplaced because they've probably got a thicker periosteum which may remain intact when the, when the fracture is undisplaced. But are even, are you sharing a presentation, Dave? Because I can't see can you it. Can not see it? No. Right to share? Yeah, thank you. You can't see it? No. Uh, not not seeable? You do not right, see it. You have to, okay, to share the screen. Um, for some reason, it's oh, basic. You know. Okay, it works. That's better. Uh, right, hang on. There we are. Perfect. Yep, got it. So I do a lateral approach. And here you can see the vertical retinacular fibers of the extensor mechanism, which you incise and you repair them later. And then what I do is I flip the condyle out and you can then clean the cancellous surfaces gently with that instrument that I showed you earlier, a Mitchell's trimmer, the most useful tool on my tray. And then it's absolutely imperative to reduce it perfectly. <clears throat> and what you need to do is basically practice reducing it. You get your fingers, you get your fingers to get to know the fracture and you just play with it for a few minutes, getting to know the sort of personality of the fracture. Once you've reduced it, what happens is, well, it's, this is what happens with me. Once I've reduced it, my fingers have learned how to reduce that fracture. So it doesn't matter if I take it apart again and put it back again. My fingers have learned how to reduce that fracture and I can just, then I can do it back in a couple of seconds. So then get everything ready. I usually hold it in reduction, as you can see with my thumbnail. And I've just elevated the collateral ligament slightly to give me a, 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 a target to insert the screw. And then what I do is I make a little dent with the other end of the Mitchell's trimmer so that the drill bit doesn't skive off when you start drilling. 
and then the screw is inserted. And the low profile of this screw head, I don't use these cannulated screws, they're too big. I just use the mini fragment screws, uh, that, which, which then sink into the cancellous bone, and that doesn't interfere with the collateral excursion when the, when the, when, as, the, um, as the joint bends. They just sink into the cancellous bend, you can just fold the collateral ligament back over the top. And there you are, you can see it bending, and there it is, fixed. Uh, you can still do these at even five weeks. They take longer to heal than shaft fractures because it's a, they're intra-articular. And as long as the joint surface isn't too buckled, you can usually unpick these. And this one was done, I think, at um, six weeks. Sometimes uh, the, the joint surface is buckled and you just need to be prepared for that. You can see here, this was a hard ball. It was a cricket ball, um, which is a bit like a baseball hitting the, the tip of the thumb and you can see that it's very convoluted and the actual, there's plastic deformation of the, uh, of the fragments. And so you won't get a perfect reduction here. So you just need to be prepared for that. There we are. And there's a lot of slides about med middle phalangeal base, which is another talk. Um, right, stop, stop sharing. There we are. You there? Hello? Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have one uh, more question. What do you do if you get patient with some stiffness after plating? Yeah. Uh, so the stability of the condylar screw fix compression with the interlocking fit? Yeah. I mean, inevitably, they will get some stiffness, but you've got to give it time. Um, a lot of the stiffness will just get better over a period of time. Um, sometimes it might even take six months to a year to get to its best. But I have seen these patients that were initially quite stiff afterwards, and I see them for other injuries a year later, and the fingers got a full range of movement. So they do, they do, um, they do free up over a period of time. Obviously, I get the, as I mentioned earlier, I get the therapists to see them within a couple of days and start moving them within limits of comfort. I don't put them in a plaster after surgery. I just bandage the finger to the finger next to it so that they can start gently moving it as soon as, as, soon as it's comfortable. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. If uh, you have a infection injury, uh, infection of the bone, uh, after uh, the fracture, do you use uh, bone graft and which one? Um, well, fortunately, I've got very little experience in infection of the bone after fixation. Because infection, I'm... not not infection, impaction of the bone. Oh, impaction. Impaction, yes. Um, so that doesn't really happen in phalangeal shaft fractures, but you do get it in fractures of the fractures of the middle phalangeal base. And yes, I do use bone graft. Uh, I use uh, bone graft out of a packet. And um, when you elevate the joint surface, you need to put more in than you think you need to. You need to actually pack it in there because it will it will um, it'll it'll compress down. And so um, I could show you some slides of that as well if you like. Peter Legion, Jonathan. Oh, normally I use the uh, cancellous um, bone from the radius. Yeah, I think if you if you do have a depressed, I mean, it's mainly a depressed articular fracture. Um, often in the good bone, if you reduce the fracture, there isn't much of a defect. But it, I would normally, if you do need bone, it's normally only a very small amount. So I, I would tend to harvest a little bit from the distal radius. Uh, they will have some uh, cases uh, yeah. about the base of the middle phalanx. He asked, can he show it? <laughs> I said, it would we do be... another webinar about that. Yeah. I am sure <laughs> of that. <laughs> okay, how, we just... <laughs> how do we run this? So if I present the case, and then do the panel ask questions or do the audience ask? Okay. 
uh, we we have a question about infection after intramedullary screw fixation. Uh, well, that's a question. Experience it's a big problem. Big and, problem. Uh, I haven't yet seen an infection after an intradermally screw fixation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but the, 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 the normal principles of infection uh, in a fracture is if you can get the, if you can suppress the infection, get the fracture to heal, then you remove the fixation. The problem is if, if you, uh, if the fracture hasn't healed and you remove uh, and you don't have any fixation, then you have an infected non-union, which is more difficult. Uh, I think, I mean the the um, risk of infection, if if you're careful in your technique, should be extremely low. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose the only time I have seen fixation uh, in infection with cannulated screws is when you use them for DIP joint fusion um, and they tend to present uh, years down the line usually with indolent skin organisms and if if you take the, the, the screw out and uh, just drill it out and wash it out and give some antibiotics uh, then they have all so far they've always settled David? It would be a disaster. An yes, infection. I think, yeah. uh, again, I, I haven't got you very share? much experience at all. Sorry? Do you have experience? Uh, are we talking about it? Do I have a what, sorry? Do you have experience with infection? No, and, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've got very little experience in infection. I've never had a, an internal fixation get infected. Yeah. I think the most important thing is handling of the soft tissues. If you handle the soft tissues very carefully and with respect, they just don't get infected in the hand. The hand is very resilient to infection unless it's compromised. If you tear the tissues and crush them and you take too long over your fixation, and the tissue don't like it, and then they'll be all inflamed and they'll become infected. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that, uh, Andrew, if you do not, we do not have other questions. Uh, we we can... have a question about extensor tendon adhesion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have an answer. When you put a plate, always say to the patient that maybe you have to remove. But <laughs> what do you think, David? Uh, when is a good time to remove a plate after, when you have to do a tenolysis? Well, I, I, virtually is... never, I virtually never use a plate. I can always manage without putting a plate on. Um... A plate of another surgeon. It's happened to you to do a tenolysis? Um, well, I'd wait until the fracture was united, take the plate off and do a tenolysis. Yeah. If, if, if necessary. But maybe. As many yeah, of these. Maybe many, the tenolysis. Yeah. Many of these get better. They, they're stiff to begin with, and then everything stretches up and, 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 and mobilizes up. So you can, you, mean, you could give it nine months to see if the fingers become more mobile, there's no harm in that. And then you can keep it as an option. I don't think you should uh, go in there too quickly. No, I, I think you have a certain inflammatory and scarring response and doing a secondary procedure that has settled uh, it is a mistake in the same way if you do a flexotene lysis. Uh, so I, I would um, you want to make sure that they are diligent with their therapy in the meantime, in that uh, it's much easier to treat an extensor lag than a fixed flexion deformity. So if, if, the, if they can maintain the passive range, uh, 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 
Sorry, Jonathan, you have a problem really with help. the... Well, if you've got a stiff joint and a stuck tendon, then you're really in trouble. Um, and uh, I would now order it. You you can be confident. You can be confident uh, that uh, you've done an adequate uh, team line. So there is another question: When you can remove the plate after three months, six months, or never? Preferably never. <laughs> if it works, never. Yeah, if, if there's no need to remove it, don't remove it, because you're inviting trouble. A lot of these plates and screws are made of titanium, which is soft, and the, the screw heads sc strip very easily. Yeah, so, I agree perfectly. Yeah. But, but if you are going to remove it, it again, it makes sense uh, to wait until the scars are mature uh, the fracture's properly healed. Uh, so probably six to 12 months. Wait until the patient has got as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Sure. So I really thank you very much. Andrew, do you want to say something more? Um, no, thank you for great talks and uh, interesting discussion. Uh, do we have uh, time? Yeah, we have time. Is, is there a case to show? Yes. I can show you some cases if you want. If you have, David. I have. How many do you want? <laughs> About uh, 15 or 20 minutes worth. Okay. Uh, I, right. I'm sorry, I'm really struggling with my... Uh, Stability of my internet this evening. Yeah, don't um, so worry. I'll turn my camera off. <laughs> so here we have a um, eighteen-year-old female. Yeah, and two days ago she tripped up the stairs and injured her right. Small finger, that's incorrect, sorry. The right small finger. And actually, <laughs> I should have hidden those details there, but uh, so what, what do you think we should do? It's a little bit deformed, it's a bit comminuted, and you can see there's a, a, a spiral fracture of the uh, proximal phalanx with a butterfly fragment. Uh, can I see the movement of the patient? Um, she so there is there is a a, a problem of malrotation. It's a bit malrotated, yes. Ah, okay. Is, is there any uh, other X rays? Other? I haven't got. I haven't got. But the, the lateral shows that there's minimal displacement. Try to reduce. Okay, and then she comes back in the next week and it looks like this again, and it's malrotated and it's a bit deformed. And there's, okay. and there's external deformity and she's 18 year old girl and she's not very happy. If it's malrotated, you, you should do some surgery. There we are, there's a closer view. I mean, I, so I'm, suspi I'm suspicious that this is in at least three pieces. Yep. Um, so, and um, in a, a lag screw fixation, uh, anatomical reduction, and if you're going to intervene, anatomical fixation, uh, reduction, and lag screw fixation, uh, is, is the best. Although, if you, if you have three fragments, it's more complicated. Have you tried traction splinting? No, nope, uh, I'll show you what I did if you like. You know, I, I think I that if you're going, you did it. I'm guessing a K-wire is exhibited. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're going to put loud screws in, that is not an easy proposition. No, very um, difficult. And you're very likely, you're very unlikely to achieve a stable enough reduction to mobilize it. It's going to be a very tenuous fixation. It's going to be a, um, it's going to be a rather extended exposure with lots of soft tissue stripping. And a difficult reduction and difficult placement of what of K of uh, lag screws. And I've done lots and lots of of, of of lag screws, and I 
I, I wouldn't contemplate doing this. So what I did was what I showed you earlier, I put a, a K wire up from the base like that. And that basically just acts as an internal strut. You can see it reduces the fracture very nicely, keeps it in place. You just need to leave it there for three weeks or so, take the wire out and mobilize it. And it's but a I perfect think, reduction, which is- I think, uh, I think, I think yeah. that's far better than opening it all up and yeah. messing about all those little fragments and potentially de devascularizing them. Okay, another case? Another yeah. case. Another case. Okay, so this is 26 year old girl fell up the stairs. Uh, and has been sent from another centre, and by now it's four weeks old. So if you look at this now, it's her right small finger. You can see it's a spiral fracture, and on the lateral, there's a butterfly <coughs> fragment. A butterfly fragment as well. And the problem is that she can't flex her proximal phalangeal joint. It only flexes to about 40 degrees, and then it comes to an abrupt mechanical end. Screws. What should we do? Open reduction and screws, leg screws. Okay. Okay, Fiano, is you, it's four weeks old. Yeah, I, I, I think um, probably you let it heal and take the spike off. Uh, yes, this is another option, yes. So if, you, if, you, if you open this up, you are absolutely asking for trouble. You've got to do lots of soft tissue stripping. You've got to unpick it. It's going to be four weeks old. It's going to be encased in callus and um, a lot of potential for complications and stiffness. However, if you just let the fracture heal, you can do a lateral approach. You can nibble off that spike there, which is actually what is blocking flexion. But there's something else you have to do to, to obtain full flexion. So you've done your lateral approach here. And then what you have to do is you have to excavate just behind the mm. condyle there to recreate the fossa into which the base of the middle phalanx goes into so that they can get there. Because the, the, the PIP joint flexes to 120, not 90. And so to get it to 120, you have to actually uh, excavate with a dental burr probably. And that's a really easy operation and they can mobilize immediately and vigorously and you'll get you will get universally good results from that, far better than if you contemplate opening it up tomorrow and trying to put all that back together with lag screws. So next case, this was in my talk. So this man is a 35 year old self-employed builder and he's been referred from another center. He injured his finger one and a half years ago. He's got a painful, stiff, swollen finger, and he has been out of work for 18 months. So you can see he's got, he's had a plate on, it's been put on from the dorsum. It's a big plate with lots of screws. There's a drill bit snapped off in there. So it's obviously had a couple of goes at it and it's now a non-union and the plate has snapped. What do you think this man's priorities are what do you think the thing that he wants to do most is? Get back to work. Get back to work. I know this case. I know this case. I cannot say anything. All this man wants to do is go back to work. He's got a ruined finger. You mm. might be able to take the x-ray better by taking all the meth work off and fixing it again. But he's going. To, if you do that, he's going to be out of work for at least another six months. And he's still going to have a an uncomfortable stiff finger. Has he got a flexion contracture of his PIP joint? I assume he has. Of course he has. Many of such hard workers came to you and just uh, asked, can you just take it off this? There we go. The voice of reason from Ukraine. What I do is I wait for them to suggest it and I say that's a really good idea. I think we should do that. And then you'll be back to work in two or three weeks. It's not ideal. It's not a perfect end to it, but you've got to do what's best for the patient and he wants to go back to work. So if you do a nice amputation and you preserve, you probably would do it through the fracture site so you can preserve um, some of that finger. 
uh, because that will be useful as long as it's not too sensitive, but it will be useful when he's grasping hammers and that sort of thing, then he'll, he'll be very pleased and he'll go back to work. So here we are, next case. The, the perils of bad it's, fixation. <laughs> Six-year-old girl, yeah, I mean, people having a play with all the instruments and doing silly things. So here's a six-year-old girl who squashed her finger in the door four weeks ago. And as you can see, she's got a subcondylar fracture, which is dorsally displaced and angulated. And again, you can see there's that spike there, which would be blocking flexion. Mm. What should we do? Well, four weeks is probably united, isn't it? Is it stable? Yep. It almost sits. Re remove remove oh. the spike. So we do, do the same again. Wait for it to completely consolidate, give it a few months, and then do a lateral approach, nibble off that spike, and excavate the subcondylar fossa. Um, I wonder if I've got any. Lateral approach better than a palmer approach? Oh, yeah, lateral, lateral. It's it's so easy. Uh, you just do a lateral approach. You could just identify the collateral ligament. Um, what you need to do is incise the periosteum and reflect the flexor mechanism palmerwards. Mm. Uh, and then you can see the spike. You just nibble it off, and then you get a dental burr. And the nicest dental burrs that I found are these spade-tipped ones. Have you seen those? Rather than the round ones or the conical ones, mm. like a little spade tip, and they are absolutely sharp as anything. They don't clog up. They're very beautiful. They're a bit more expensive. That's the only thing. But they're just shaped like a little oblong, like a little yeah. oblong like that. And they're really sharp. And they are better than any other birds I've used. So we're going off the, going off, off piece a bit here. So 26 year old, right hand dominant, two days ago, injured his finger on a dry ski slope. And you know, these dry ski slopes, they've got this honeycomb matting. Mm. These people who are not very good skiers, they go for a bit of practice before their skiing holiday, they fall over and they stub their finger on that honeycomb matting and they get injuries like this. So you can see his proximal phalangeal joint uh, has got um, this pilon fracture where the, if you think of it in three columns, there's a palmar column, there's a middle column and there's a dorsal column. For that middle column to be depressed, those two lateral columns have to move apart so one of these mm. columns is stuck off. So if you look at it really carefully, um, let me see, have I got, no, I haven't. Unfortunately, I've got them out of order a bit. Uh, you can see this palmar cortex is intact. Mm. If you look at this dorsal cortex, it's a bit hinged. So if you do a dorsal approach, you can hinge that open on the central slip. You can put some traction on the finger and you can reduce that articular surface and you can pack it with bone graft and then you can just fix that back on. And I'm just wondering, let me just see if I can find the, um, I'm using two screens here, so it's a bit. Uh, I have a question. Can you try to? Uh, here is, here's a pictorial view of it. So it, there it is, there's the, palmar column, which is intact. There's the middle column, which is duffed in, and there's the dorsal column, which is snapped off. So you've hinged that open on the central slip, you pack bone graft in to restore that articular surface, and then you fix it back on like a sandwich. And if it's if it's the palmar column that's come off, you just do it from the palmar side. Um, what was your question, Andre? Uh, can you try to manage this type of fracture like uh... Hindringer, uh, do he uh, makes something like the Suzuki frame and then uh, make a little? <laughs> uh, I think that the problem with the Suzuki frame here, Andre, is uh, it won't reduce these the pilon, yeah, um, and but... the joint is the, the joint is spread apart, so uh. The the Suzuki won't reduce the impaction of the middle uh, column, but yeah. Stringer makes uh, a little window in the dorsal cortex, and then uh, he flex his key wire like, uh, mm. like this, 
and put the key wire and uh, reduce under the fluoro, he reduces this impaction of the middle column. He showed this in one of his uh, webinars. Yeah. And, and if you use a Suzuki frame, you're basically relying on remodeling of the joint. You don't get an anatomical reduction by any means. What I'm aiming for with this technique is to restore the anatomy and get it moving immediately. Uh, I've been fixing these now for about 20 years and I've fixed some fairly, uh, some fairly horrendous looking fractures and actually you can fix them. Uh, and in fact, um, my, my middle son got one of these fractures this time last year playing rugby and I fixed his and he got a full range of movement before the stitches came out. And he was back playing rugby before Christmas. His PIP joint is quite swollen, but it's getting better. I got Ryan to help me for a bit of moral support. I was going to say, you didn't officially fix it, Mr. Shearing. No, I put Ryan's name on the operation sheet, but I did it. Uh, have you got one more for us before we close, Dave? Uh, yeah, one more. Again, it's a bit off-piste. So this is a slightly unusual one. 20-year-old man playing football, he dislocated his proximal phalangeal joint and the physiotherapist put it back on the side of the pitch a few days ago. Any comments? Uh, it, well, it's not reduced. So you've got a lateral of the middle phalanx and an oblique uh, yes, of the phalanx. proximal phalanx. That's very good. So it's I would be suspicious that there might be um, uh, an entrapped lateral band. Either that or there's a condylar fracture. But I, I suspect that it, 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 there's an incarcerated, it's buttonholed and there's an incarcerated lateral band. Yes, that's exactly what's happened. And this is a, these can form to a very uh, predictable pattern. Um, you can see sometimes it's much more subtle than this. And what you will see when you clinically examine them is you just can't fully extend the, the, the PIP joint. And so you do have to explore them a little speculatively. And so there's a more obvious one there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I do a dorsal approach. You get good access to both sides. And you can see here that, let me just get my pointer. Can you, can you see this arrow? Yes. You see the arrow? Yes. There's the central slip. There's the lateral band. And that's his condyle, which is buttonholed in between a rent in the mechanism, in the extensor, me in the extensor mechanism, in between central slip and, and lateral band. And the lateral band is hooked underneath the condyle. You can also see that the surface of the condyle is denuded. And that's because the collateral ligament is, is completely torn off. And so all you do is extend the rent in the in the lateral band, uh, and then you can just flick the lateral band back over with a often with a skin hook. And I don't do anything to repair the ligament; I just place it back where it came from, and then you just repair it with some vicryl, and there it is. And they seem to do very well. Get them they're, mobilized. They're very reward. They're very rewarding because uh, they're, they're, they're actually easier to treat than you think, and they're almost impossible to treat if you miss it. Well, they're very rewarding because you think to yourself, this would have been so dreadful if I hadn't explored it. So I'd rather explore one and find that there's not much to do than miss one that I should have explored. Mm. So if I'm, if I'm ever suspicious of one of these, I tend to explore them, and I'm very, very rarely disappointed. I think I've explored one to find that there was nothing really much to find out of perhaps 30, perhaps 30 I've done over the, my whole career. Uh, they're not very common, so it's only about one a year. May I ask to you, David, if you do, I know the, the answer, but if you do examination like MRI or something like before surgery? Um, I haven't tried that actually. I don't know what an MRI would show, and I'm not sure the radiologist would be would know what they were looking at. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't tried it. I just explore them because even if the MRI, 
even if the MRI is a bit reassuring, I'd still want to explore it because I'd be so I would be so terrified of missing this. I think if you're going to use an investigation, ultrasound would probably be better. And the spatial resolution of ultrasound is much better. An MRI in acute injuries where there's a lot of swelling is very hard to interpret often. Yeah, ultrasound is um, so high definition now, isn't it? Yes. So they are. I'll stop my sharing. Excellent. So, Thank you very much. Pierre Luigi, Andre, do you want to do the business and close the webinar? Well, just before we close, we have another webinar planned for next month talking about tumours, which is not directly conflict related, uh, but it's something we haven't covered so far. So we have uh, Manny Ragbeer, uh, who is the president of the British Association of uh, Plastic Surgeons, talking about malignant tumours. I'm going to do a short talk on uh, non-malignant tumours. And I think, Pierre Luigi, you're going to show us some cases, aren't you? It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much, David. I learned a lot. Thank you for your okay. beautiful lectures. Uh, uh, please, Andrew, to you, to close. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, David, for sharing your experience and knowledge with us and uh, for many of these tips and tricks of how to manage these phalangal fractures. Uh, not uh, after these uh, talks, you one once again understand that uh, all these fancy things like a little. Uh, uh, very beautiful plates, uh, not always works well. Uh, sometimes the easiest way is a better way. Uh, so thank you very much. I think it was uh, very useful talks for us. Uh, I also thank uh, Pierre Luigi for moderating this session professionally. Thanks. And uh, of course, I thank all the attendees. Today we have about 130 uh, during our webinar. So thank you all. And uh, I think that's that's all. <laughs> we will see you next month. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Thank you.